Hello friends, I hope you all are doing great. This is Tom Driver for any of you who are new and this is the Drive Fitness program. Today my guest is Josh Clements. Josh and I both attended JMU's Summer Accelerator program together in 2018. At the time he had started a company called Playwell that was accepted into the program and his company would build modified musical instruments for people with special needs that couldn't use normal instruments. Since the Accelerator program, Josh joined a company called Vintech, which we talk about today as well. Vintech is a software application that is a management system for vineyard owners. So Josh and I today, we talk about both his experience at Vintech and Playwell, and we also discuss overcoming failure, how storytelling can help entrepreneurship, and a lot of other interesting topics. As of right now, we just hit 900 downloads, and March 31st is actually the day that I launched the first episode of the podcast. So I'm not usually super focused on numbers. Uh, I get pretty excited just to have you know anybody watching the show and paying attention to my journey, but it does seem like um, a nice, easy target for me to shoot towards 1,000 downloads by the end of year one, right? So I'm going to try my hardest to release an episode every week of March, and it shouldn't be too hard for me to hit this mark, but if you guys want to help me out, the best way to do that would be pick an episode and send it to a couple friends who might be interested, right? And really um, pick an episode because, you know, we cover a bunch of different topics here on the podcast, and I don't know if everyone would be interested if you just sent them, you know, the the podcast uh, in general, but if you pick out an episode that, you know, might actually apply to one of your friends or family members and send them and say, hey, I think you enjoy this, you know, you'd be playing a pretty big part in helping me reach my, you know, first big milestone with the podcast. Because, you know, one year in, a thousand downloads, right? Like, it doesn't get much simpler than that as a first big milestone. So, you know, help me out, spread the word, and just, you know, keep on tuning in because uh, we're almost there. As always, don't forget to download the Drive Fitness app and give us some good feedback. We would really appreciate that as always. As usual, thank you, Frank, for making our theme music. And I hope everybody enjoys today's episode with Josh Clements. All right, man. So are you like a senior now in school? Yeah. What is your major? Um, It's engineering focused on electronics and uh, software engineering as well. Um, So I really hope to be a software engineer once I get out. But the only thing I don't have is like formal education. I never took CS classes or anything like that. Isn't it so weird that they take engineers these days and they all become software engineers almost? (laughs) Yeah, it's it's funny though because like in... um, the engineering program here, I'm like one of maybe five out of our graduating class that want to be software engineers. Really? Everyone else wants to be like a civil or a mechanical engineer because that's like the core kind of competencies of our program. We don't have any software classes or training or anything. But if you give it like 10, 15 years, like half of those people will all be in tech. Oh, yeah. Because that's just... Or either tech or management. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> true. So you actually do want to make them um, switch to software though when you graduate. Yeah, yeah. I want to switch to software. Um I, that's kind of just the area that interests me most. And I like the fact that like you don't have to have a whole lot of capital to make something in, mm-hmm. in software. You don't have to have a whole lot of your own money. If anything, you're just paying for like API key pulls, yeah. which in like a controlled environment, that's pretty cheap. Mm-hmm. Um, so I really like that aspect. Like anything's, anything's really possible mm-hmm. without, you know, costing you too much money. Yeah, man. That's why I built software instead of like the um, the smart dumbbells or something, just because like... I would have to get investments and like get a bunch of capital together. Whereas like we've been building this software for years with basically like a little over a hundred dollars a month on the database database fees. It's really not, it's really not much at all, you know? Yeah. Plus like, um, you know, when you're testing sensors, cause like anything you build, you're going to need to test it and then it's probably not going to work. And then you need to try something new. 
when it's software, you just like rewrite the code. Mm-hmm. But when it's like a sensor, then you have to buy a new sensor if you fucking mm-hmm. break it or, um, yeah. you know, or you just have to build a whole new system or get a whole new unit manufactured for testing, mm-hmm. which that's expensive as hell. Cause I'm working on like a little pet project where I'm, um, I'm like doing, uh, using visuals to wake you up rather than like aud- auditory because like every alarm clock is auditory Ooh. so it's like opens up your window it's like uh based on whatever the timer is but that's been a whole different experience because um you actually have to make it you have to do like the uh the pcb board design and all that mm-hmm. and then you have to find someone to manufacture it um mm. which it's crazy in yeah, comparison I- we were trying to build a custom PCB board for my capstone, and it was such a headache, dude. It was so hard. I think it's gotten easier, but yeah, man, that that stuff can be really tedious, and you really gotta, like you said, work with a manufacturer and like actually get it all printed correctly. And if you mess it up, you gotta retry it a couple times. It's it's a pain in the ass. So it actually reminded me. I've I've heard of this one alarm clock that it like shakes you awake instead of making noise. It like I think my brother had it, it like like vibrated his whole bed. <laughs> so it's called the atomic bomb alarm clock. I Is know it? this because I I own one. <laughs> oh, you own one. <laughs> yeah, so I can't wake up worth shit ever um, from audio. Yeah, or okay. just any. I, I'll get like used to my phone alarms or something like that. So the one I have, it's like uh, it just screams at loud uh, as loud as possible. It's almost like a fire alarm, mm. but then it flashes lights in your eyes and shakes your bed on the same Bro, time. That's gonna give you a seizure. <laughs> <laughs> it's awful. It's like the worst. Uh, it's the worst waking up experience. But I'm not gonna lie. Like I had an exam this morning for one mm. of my gen ed classes, um, and that is the only thing I can rely on to be like, I know I'm gonna wake up mm. from this. Um, I know, I know, I won't miss my exam because like class, it's one thing, and it sucks a little bit. But like an exam or like. You know, once I get to work, I got to start yeah. <laughs> training myself to actually wake up. But so, um, you're looking for something that's a little more subtle than that, but still doesn't use audio and it's going to pull the blinds up automatically. Yeah. Yeah. So it just it's um, the design I'm working with right now just uses like two uh, inversely rotating like uh, uh-huh. DC motors so that it just opens up the blinds like we you know have right over here. Um, you know, it's just a concept. I thought it was a cool idea. And I have, I'm in an electronics manufacturing class right now. So it was kind of like, oh, why not try it? Cause, uh, I get one free PC board print mm-hmm. at the end of it. So I was like, if I can, you know, work on something that could become, you know, something more in like the area I'm interested in, then why not? Um, yeah, no, it's super interesting because apparently sunlight early in the day triggers some sort of like evolutionary cycle that we've developed over years that like shocks your brain into like, a certain like awake mode you know what i'm saying because people were living outside like, <laughs> yeah. people, most we're, of the time uh, living outside <laughs> so like, i don't know exactly how it happened but i think it happened like we were outside and like the sun just fucking woke us up and that's like how we used to wake up so i, I think sunlight would be the most like natural way of getting yourself up yeah and i feel like the only people that have that option are people that have like smart homes or like they're fully automated the mm. thing where you know you see in like um there's that movie with the rock when he has that uh the little kid that he mm-hmm. didn't know he had and he's like a football player or something and all of his windows open up automatically when he like presses a yeah. button like that could be possible for them but like with your plain old you know pull the string what's a cheaper option so you can do the same thing mm-hmm. um kind of deal because it's just supposed to be a little trinket i might do like a um a kickstarter on it or something like that yeah but it's probably going to be a one-off not like a you know long-term company or anything like that i think it would just be a neat idea no that's definitely something that like the smart home whatever companies would want to integrate you know even if it's not a standalone product because yeah i had a I can't wait till I can afford that shit because I had a friend he had like a thermostat where he would set like the temperature to change like 15 minutes before he got home from work and like when he went to bed and like all these you know like I get home and like I have to go change it and then like 15 minutes later it'll warm up my house or whatever but if you have a smart home you know you can start warming up your house and shit while you're driving home and stuff and I'm like damn dude that'd be so cool and then another thing like I actually leave my blinds cracked, right? Because I know the sunlight will wake me up, but maybe I don't want them open at 6 a.m. I want them to start opening at 9, you know? So whether it's a Tassus alarm clock or not, I feel like people are going to want that kind of product in their house, you know, 
It's uh, just it just seems like you know a neat idea, something kind of fun to work on. Teach me more about actual because like I've done all the you know prototyping stuff, hand soldering, and mm-hmm. I think it's a cool i kind of cool simple way to bring myself um into more expertise within like actually manufacturing electronics on like mm-hmm. an automated scale because you know soldering resistors by hand has no correlation with like you said designing a pcb board that shit's awful because yeah. <laughs> yeah. all you have are like the lines where it's like oh the copper goes here type deal and it's mm. way more confusing yeah right it's so weird I, I was messing around with my capstone and once with some gym equipment with like soldering and stuff and you're like what am i even building because this is not going to translate into a product like very easily right there's got to be like 10 more <laughs> steps until like a machine is putting this all together in like a perfect yeah. fashion you know you, it's good for like proof of concept you know yeah but yeah, there's so many more people that need to get involved from like taking the engineering idea to like, okay, people are going to pay for this thing, you know? Yeah, and I think, um, you know, our, our friends at Bar Track had that issue too where Neth, uh, the engineer that was working on their team back when we were in the accelerator together, mm-hmm. um, he had been like, you know, soldering things and putting sensors together. But then once they got to a certain point when they wanted to actually like launch it or do more official tests, they're mm-hmm. like, okay, we need a professional engineer to get the electronics manufactured. Mm-hmm. And then Neth's entire like um, responsibilities, he didn't like have any besides mm-hmm. he just talking and trying to learn from the engineer. So that's why he ended up leaving and uh, he works at um, Innovative Refrigeration Systems now. But um, yeah, it's a it's huge learning curve between the two. Yeah. It's so hard to like grow your company and not run yourself um absolute right without like needing to do anything because you always need like other people to come in and like do what you're doing but better you know I, obviously i had to work with a software developer who was better than me at a certain point and then i'm like okay now what am i doing because <laughs> every hour i spend coding you know he can do that in like 20 minutes you know so that's why i've started like moving on to, like getting personal training certi- uh, certificate like doing o- other things like with social media because as soon as you do something well and you find someone else to do it you got to bring value to this company now in some other way you know or else like i don't know it's weird how like companies are not something you own like a like a computer that works for you you know like they're like an organism that they'll spit you up and chew you out you know what i'm saying if like you if you're not the best thing for them you know they're it's like really weird like that you know yeah, I had, um, that reminds me, I had met this dude, uh, what is it called? I think it's called like Foundation Capital. It's one of the bigger uh, capital firms out, or venture capital firms out in San Francisco. And he's a JMU alum. Mm. And he came and like visited and talked. And he was like, yeah, about uh, 90% of, of the uh, of the companies we invest in, we end up kicking the founders out. And I'm just yeah. like, holy shit. Yeah. <laughs> that's kind of like savage, but also terrible at the same time. Because that's like... Like, you know, both of us have started businesses. Like, that's like your baby. And then, mm-hmm. you know, CPS is just like, nope, that is our baby now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, I mean, um, I just, mean it's... Uh, yeah. Steve Jobs, uh, he got kicked out of his company, Apple, at one point. So, I mean, it could happen to anybody. I mean, yeah. it really can. It's like so many factors could play into that. You don't work well with the coworkers or the investors or someone else is doing it better. Or, like, there's so many reasons that could get you booted out of your own company. I mean, at least you get paid out at that point, but yeah, that's scary, man. <laughs> yeah. And since it's such like a more complex job, it's like, instead of just doing, you know, working a regular job where you're doing one task or you have like one set of skills that fits one set of needs, it's like, you're just doing so much stuff and interacting with so many different people as like a startup founder. Yeah. That there's so much more opportunity to get booted out of there too. And it's like you put so much of yourself into it, you know? Like, I mean, I literally put my name on my company. It'd be kind of hard, <laughs> awkward if I got kicked out. But, like, not just the name, but, like, you put so much of, like, who you are and your personality and your heart and soul into it. It's not like another job. Like, if you just get hired by someone, you're like, okay, I'm just doing this for a living. Even if you enjoy it, you're like, okay, I'm just providing my talents and time for money. It's like, it's more of just like um, a trade off where, if you're starting a company, like you really believe in this idea, you believe in yourself and it takes so much like courage to like build up to that point to even decide to start it. And then all the time and energy and then everything, then just to be told like, yeah, you're not the right guy to run this company. It's like, well, this wouldn't exist without me starting it. So what are you, like, <laughs> what are you saying? You know? Yeah. And that like kind of reminds me of when um, me and a good friend started Vine Tech together. He was in the accelerator with us too. Yeah, wait, let's uh, talk about Vine Tech then, um, like, 
what is that Perhaps company so. before we just jump into it? Yeah, so it was um, it was a software company focused around uh, optimizing vineyard spray processes. So like uh, their pesticides, fungicides, uh, insecticides, um, and things like that, and using different weather patterns, time of year, portions of the growth process, and all that stuff that goes into farming and you know growing plants to figure out um, the amount of spray and what kind of spray uh, to apply. So. Um, to ultimately, you know, cut down on spray budgets because a lot of times they'll either spray too much or they'll just spray something all throughout the year just because they think it's always, you know, at risk. But there's certain portions when you can actually exclude, you know, protection of things like that in order to save the vineyard's money. And they'll pay like um, vineyard consultants, like depending on the size of the vineyard, anywhere from like five to 30 grand a year <laughs> just for like their single wow. vineyard. Yeah. So we were kind of trying to make a virtual uh, consultant uh, type deal. Like a tool for consultants to use or they could just consult the app instead? They could just consult the app. That was the idea behind it. Because like the current state of it, it was a lot of like um, touch and feel, like a lot of opinions. Mm -hmm. So it would be like they would go look at the grapes and be like, oh, this one kind of looks like, you know, X color. So it's deficient in this. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, then you don't know if that just applies to the one plant you're looking at. You know, is it worth spraying your entire vineyard with a certain spray because one plant looks unhealthy and you don't know, you know, the state of the other plants? Was there any sensors or anything involved that like gave them more feedback than what that software software could provide? Um, so no, we actually didn't have to use any like physical sensors. So a lot of the stuff uh, came into like figuring out the weather patterns within the vineyard by looking at um, like a lot of the vineyards had like a micro weather modules. I can't remember like weather underground type deal, mm. you know, where you can buy a weather module and it tells you like hyper localized weather. So we used a lot of things like that to, to figure out. Um, and then based on, you know, the elevations, we could then figure out what the state of, um, you know, weather patterns or, you know, microclimates were within certain areas of the vineyard. So we didn't, you know, have okay. to pay or build any sensors, which and is nice. What's the business model? Like they would pay you guys a monthly subscription or something to use your app? Yeah, it was just the standard like SaaS model. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Um, and so what were you doing? Like what was your job? Were you working with the software, like building that out? So at first that like I, in my experience, software has been a lot more hands on as of recent. I think at the time I had like one or maybe two software projects and it was uh -huh. in terms of like a physical sensor where I was collecting data or something like that. And, you know, now I've gone into more web development and algorithm design uh, and things like that. But at the time I had like virtually no software experience. So we, um, we reached out to a couple different, we ended up going through, I think two different dev firms. One that was just going to do it as kind of a charity case they knew we didn't have money and they were trying to build up their name too so they thought it'd be cool if they created a product and then we grew it that they could then be like oh we were the software development shop that you know developed this and that was kind of their take on it um that ended up following falling through um they just had like paying jobs to work on they were like we don't have time for this um but we already had we were talking to vineyards and stuff like that and they were like when is this going to be done like we want to use it we want to test it um, so we went to another one up in Boston. Uh, it's called 923 Digital. Uh, it's run by two pretty good friends of mine. They're awesome guys. Um, but they ended up taking it on more as like an investment case. So we didn't get any physical cash or anything like that. And you would in a normal investment standpoint. They basically just allocated people within their company to our team. Mm -hmm. And their, uh, you know, whatever their salary was for that period of time and how much work they put in was allocated as investment. Mm. but um and we had to hit you know certain sales goals in order to uh get the company back regain equity so basically it was like we sold the company to them uh for a certain amount of money and as we hit our sales goals we regained equity back in Whoa, the company that sounds like just having a job all of a sudden <laughs> <laughs> yeah that was um and and you know i love those guys but that was one of the reasons i ended up leaving uh vine tech back in february of 2020 was we Virtually, the deal we had was a it was a three year deal, uh -huh. um, so I was signing away three years of my life, and I'm thankful that they were accepting of me just walking away because I relinquished any equity or any you know IP I had in uh -huh. the idea, and I also you know signed uh, 
non-compete forms, non-disclosures mm. about like the more specific things. Um, so they were, they were okay with me walking away from that once, you know, I'd realized it wasn't for me. Cause then at mm. that point I was basically a salesperson and an agricultural or chemical engineer. Like I was educating all the software developers on pesticides, fungicides, <laughs> and insecticides, which um, you're like, this is not what I was trying to do. No. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And it's like um, all my other projects like had some sort of emotional tie to like it was either, uh, you know, medical condition that a family member had or like uh, experiences that like friends or family had had that I wanted to you know, help find a solution to, you know, either solve or make those things easier. But mm -hmm. in this case, it was just pure like cool, we can make money off this and a mixture of, I'm not a, you know, very money driven person yeah. and, um, not having that emotional tie kind of just was like, mm, maybe this isn't for me. And, uh, we had a clean break, you know, I'm still friends with them. I was talking to one of them the other day. They're, they're great guys, but you know, when they took over and, you know, were giving us financial help, it was basically their project at that point on. And, um, you know, mm -hmm. we were helping them hit the goals so that we could pay them back. We were, you know, in debt um, to them. So that, you know, is a whole new experience compared to when you're just bootstrapping it and mm -hmm. putting in whatever of your own salary you can into the project where you get to make whatever decisions you want to. Mm -hmm. um, it's more of if we ever wanted to make a decision, we had to hold a meeting with like seven people involved. Be like, yeah. hey, is this a good move? Which is a, a lot different. Yeah, I think it's definitely super important to be passionate and excited and like energized when you work on your startup or else you're just going to burn out eventually, you know, so it looks like you caught yourself before then. And then, yeah, I think at a certain point you do have to relinquish control, but as long as you're happy with like the, the culture and like the product that you've created before you give up control, I think that that can grow a little bit better. But like for me, I, I I'm not really happy where, where I'm at, you know, and so even though it's been years, I'm like not ready to relinquish any control yet until I kind of know where I'm going. So I'm glad you didn't stay with that. And just, if it feels like a job, like it feels like you're just working for them all of a sudden and it's not really what you wanted to do in life. You know what I'm saying? You definitely should just go rethink things. And then I like how you said you still have a good relationship with them because do you remember Blake? Yeah, um, yeah, Blake. He yeah. was one of your developers. On, yeah, uh, so he was one of my developers on Drive that summer of the Accelerator program, and he actually left to start another app, right? But we had a really clean break, and we're, like, so cool. And um, we actually have started meeting up with them on Clubhouse. Yeah, I think for, I like, saw that on your, your yeah. story last night. Yeah. yeah, we did that last night, and, like, we, you know, because now it's, like, our app and their app, we, we can already get a room of, like, four people together in the Clubhouse room to, like, kind of, like, start it off strong. And then we just like network with a bunch of like developers and we kind of like help each other market each other's apps like in the moment because we're just we're just talking about software development, not about the apps, you know. But then the more people we talk to, the more people are like, oh, let me download your thing and check it out. And so anyways, I think um, it should definitely help you in the future, right, to just still have like those good attachments at the companies that you've started working with, you know, like uh, you can learn from them. You can there's a there's a lot of good that can come out of, you know leaving on good terms i think with some of these companies yeah and um yeah i, de I definitely agree with that because like they launched a another product because they're you know a dev shop they do a lot of their own independent products uh that they launch as well and they hired a you know ceo they mainly mm -hmm. just did the development for that one but it's called like altar and it's connected to churches um and i used to be you know really well connected in my youth group and things like that so uh, I'd helped them out. I'd called some up, uh, some people up that used to be in the more management side of the youth group and be like, hey, do you know any churches involved? Or like if me, like I had said, I got more into software development in their dev shop. I, whenever I have questions, I just call them up mm -hmm. or like shoot them a text and say like, hey, um, am I doing this in you know the right way? What is the best way to learn you know, like object oriented programming or something like that? And they've always, you know, responded within a you know, timely manner, been like super open to having that conversation with me. Um, yeah, so they, they've been, you know, great. It's still been like a, a very uh, mutually beneficial relationship even after I left, which mm. has been cool. Um, but, you know, I had thought for a while that maybe, you know, once you quit a job or leave something, people are going to hold that against you, but they really didn't at all. And um, yeah, I think what <clears throat> resonates to me about your story that like 
probably kept um, good terms with them is that it seems like you saw it through until you kind of delegated your responsibilities out to other people. Like you said, you weren't really doing what you signed up to do, which means that you had passed on those responsibilities, which means they were going to be okay without you, right? I think that like, say you're a startup of three people and like, say one of you guys is a software developer. If he just leaves and there's no other software developer and like you got user base and you got bugs to fix, it's like, yeah, we're not on good terms anymore, dude. You just left, you know? Yeah. But if you were like, hey, I'm going to, I want to leave soon, but let's look for another software developer and, and, you know, the CEO um, or the founder is like, okay, you know, just give me a couple months. He finds another software developer and you transfer that knowledge over right? Then, okay, then you can leave. We're all on good terms. You know what I'm saying? That's like a very important step that for me would be a problem if you, if like an employee or a partner didn't take the time to transfer their responsibilities and knowledge over to the next guy, you know? Yeah. And if they do that, then it's like, all right, we're cool. Like, you know, it, you know I, I don't want anyone to like work for me or, you know, be a coworker of mine that doesn't want to be there. Like that's just not fun for anybody, but you got to, you got to see it through sometimes yeah, a couple months a or a couple, bit, yeah. at least a couple of weeks after you want to leave. You can't just drop your mic and head out, you know? Yeah. Which, um, yeah. And, and it was really easy. Cause like I said, during that time I was mostly a salesperson and like a viticulture specialist. If you want to say I was not anywhere near a specialist, but like as much knowledge as we needed uh -huh. uh, to get the software done. And at that point I had already like, you know, taught or like talk to a lot of people about all of the, the, um, viticulture stuff. I send them all the resources that I had, you know, before I left. And, um, and we had, you know, Ben and one of his friends that you hadn't met named Jacob and they were also mainly sales and like business development. So they were, you know, fine taking on more of the sales calls. Cause at that time it was all three of us going, um, to the sales calls and the, you know, the sales meetings since it was pre COVID, um, to kind of all learn together and things like that and make sure we were pitching the right things to, to the, uh, clients and stuff like that. So it was very easy just to be like, Hey, you know, I'm not really feeling this anymore. You know, at that moment in time, I didn't have a whole lot of individual responsibilities. Mm. Yeah, man, that's, um, Super interesting. I, I do want to talk a little bit too about the musical instrument company that you were running when I first met you. So when I first met you, we were both in Jamie's Accelerator program together and I was like a fifth year and you were a freshman. That's just crazy to me that yeah. like it's but, been four years since that started. That feels like mm, yesterday. <laughs> no, it feels like yesterday to me too. I can't believe it's, I think it's been three though, hasn't it? Oh, oh yeah. This next summer. Yeah. Yeah. Will be, uh, this three and a half, it's been three and a half ish. Oh, it has almost been four. Jesus yeah. Christ. Wow. But anyways, my point is like everyone else in that program was a junior or a senior, right? And you were like by far the youngest person that had ever been in that accelerator program. So I was already like super impressed with you back then. And if I remember correctly, you were building musical instruments for people with special needs, right? Who yeah. they couldn't, um, I guess, use the normal instrument and you were like adjusting like, you know, through engineering the shape um, of an instrument that fit whatever special needs they had. Um, is that correct? Or can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. And um, so I'll start with like the preface, like it originally started in a, a class project that we were working on because uh, the engineering program tries to give you clients for everything so that you're actually, you know, you have someone to talk to, you get that really like a almost real world experience because when you're at a job you're not just working on a hypothetical project you also have to interact with a client and things like that so uh, we were working with an elementary school student uh, named Miss Ghana and she had cerebral palsy so uh, my team ended up designing a an ultrasonic theremin for her that like strapped to her wheelchair so wherever she moved her hands within the playing field it would play notes according to where her hands were the best moment with that was just um, we got to go there and test it out with her and seeing like the smile on her face as, as she was moving her hands over the field and like hearing the notes um, was a really cool experience. And that's kind of what pushed me uh, forward to want to wanna start that. Um, but yeah, so it was we wanted to work with special needs programs so that we could basically provide them with uh, like music therapy. It's been shown that music therapy can help a lot, especially with like the enjoyment of life and, and coping mechanisms and just overall learning, relating things to learning as well. Um, so, and they don't quite get that experience with a lot of instruments being built for, you know, the 
abled people of the world. So we wanted to kind of bring that forward through either adjusting them. And, you know, in her case, we had to build a whole new thing because of of, uh, her state. She had a very, you know, limited range of motion going on. So it was really hard to try and, you know, make a guitar, you know, fit that area and have her finger dexterity be strong enough to play that guitar. So really just bring the world of music to them was the hope. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really like that idea. And I really like even though it seemed like maybe it wasn't scalable because everyone needed a like specially designed instrument. I like how you were able to make some instruments, you know, for some of the customers and actually bring that experience to a couple people and kind of get the... um, you know, sometimes I work on a feature or something and I don't actually, it doesn't ever make it to anybody. It just dies in the idea room or the whatever room. And, uh, I like how you were able to see at least one of these instruments all the way through and see and get the, um, satisfaction of seeing like someone learn to play an instrument who without your help, like wouldn't have been able to, like, that must've been a powerful moment. I feel like for you just realizing just like the power of entrepreneurship and engineering in general, right? Like that must, that, I mean, that's just freaking awesome, you know? Yeah, that that was a really cool moment. And I will say the problem was scaling because <laughs> yeah. on each of the instruments, it would take us like a couple weeks to get it done. And it would be me, another engineer, um, Chris. And then there was a um, music education specialist because, mm-hmm. you know, we're not musicians. We didn't know anything about the music side. We can make it technically happen. But, yeah. you know, if we don't have the right materials, then you're not going to really create sound or like the right concavity if you're talking, you know, still relating it back to guitars and things like that. So that's just three people working, you know, a month on a project. So hypothetically, in the real world, have been paid like full time. That would have been a very expensive um, instrument. But it was really cool because we got to work with like the ARC organization. They have one in Harrisonburg and one in Stanton. So we got to work with both of them for a little bit. Um, and we also got to learn a lot just about how, you know, we as abled people, we go through this experience every day and we see it as normal and things like that. But in reality, there are people that don't have the same experience as us. And it was just kind of like a reality check to like appreciate, you know, the abil- the uh, physical capabilities that I have and recognize that, you know, those people, you know, deserve to be happy as well. You know, they're, they're human beings. And I think that was like the coolest part about it because I just got to talk and like meet a lot of those people um, <clears throat> and interact with them and, you know, play music with them. So that was really, really a lot of fun and a huge learning experience for me, um, both in entrepreneurship and realizing that scalability is a big part of business, but also just in, you know, life. Mm-hmm. Yeah, man. Music is such a powerful tool that transcends, you know, like humanity in a way it's like it, it, it colors our history and time periods and it connects people. You know, like people are still following the notes that like Beethoven and Mozart wrote down. Like it's, it connects people through different time periods and just it, it brings you to some like it connects you to some sort of like universal consciousness in a way. The Whatever frequency, you know, those notes hit, it does something special. And yeah, I think it is a human right that everyone should get the chance to experience music or, or contribute and play music. Like that's that's like definitely something I could, you know see myself getting behind and being passionate about and and really like we were saying earlier about really feeling the product that you're working on and that must have been pretty rewarding um did you have a strong connection to music going into that yeah um not at all not at all (laughs) no i i have no musical abilities whatsoever well that's Um, even cool and then i'm sure you learned a lot through that process and kind of everything i just talked about you probably were realizing that through that journey Yeah, it was a ton of learning curves because like I think I tried to like 3D print an instrument at one point and the sound was just so off. It wasn't even a note that existed um, and it didn't sound good. (laughs) It wasn't in a good way. Um, So that was a huge learning curve because I knew nothing about music or how to make instruments. Uh, So that was really cool. And that was like really one of the things that pushed in my mind, like don't be scared of the unknown, like Mm -hmm. kind of take it in and take the challenge. And if you can't do it, if it's something, you know, you're not able to learn just because you don't have, you know, a close enough tie to or something like that, that's okay. Mm -hmm. Um, But in that case, it was it was super rewarding just to take that challenge and really see it through for a bit. So you were more passionate about just helping someone with special needs. And then you realized that building instruments was 
one way that you could, you know, provide help there. Yeah. And that was kind of the driving passion behind it all. Yeah, exactly. And I just think like in theory, music's really cool because like, you know, we're we both work on software and, you know, it's cool and it's fun and you mm. get to make products out of nothing. But one day there's going to be new technology that makes that app obsolete like blockchains coming into play and you have dApps going on when is that going to take over Mm -hmm. and like the regular ios structure no longer going to exist not you're not going to not saying that's going to happen or anything like that but like technology becomes outdated but like we still there's still people that listen to beethoven like music never gets obsolete there might be new styles of music that come into play but it's it's forever bro that's that's why i started this podcast well one of the reasons i was telling dan on my last podcast that there was a point where my app was like not working and I wasn't sure if we were going to continue on. And it felt like I, I, I spent all this time building it out. Right. And then, you know, just same as a company, how a company is like a living, breathing thing. Software is like a living, breathing thing. Like if you don't work on it, it'll die. You know what I'm saying? And it, it's like, I just remember thinking like if I had spent the past three years working on like a musical album, you know, I could go back and revisit that. Like say, no one like maybe I was getting funded or I had a partner say they they left and I had to stop making music like I could still be like remember that time I made the music but like I had nothing left over from the software you know and so I needed to promote the pod uh the app with the podcast but also like along the way I'm realizing like these podcast episodes they capture like a moment in time and like I can reflect back on them and to me they're more of like a piece of art like software is art but it's like living art in the way that like a person is art you know like designed by evolution you know software it's like it you can't go back to like the original version of instagram and be like well isn't this cool but you can go back to like your favorite rapper's first album and you know it's just like there's something satisfying about putting out a piece of art that's like done when it's done you know and it's like this is good or perfect and put a stamp of approval on it put it out to the world and then just like grow you can grow past it and reflect on it and yeah, I don't know. Software, it's not like that. It's yeah. I thought it would be like that for some reason, or I just didn't think about it. I just thought I was like creating my masterpiece, like some sort of Van Gogh or Beethoven with this app, but it's like no. Like if I die and no one's there to like keep paying my database fees, this app ceases to exist. <laughs> no one's there to keep paying. That's just funny. You know? Um, <laughs> <laughs> or like fix the bugs or do things. Yeah. Or up, you got to update the, the code all the time. We're constantly updating the, the, the code we use, you know, to the newest version. It's just like, it's, it's a full-time job to keep up with it. You know, it's like raising a kid. It's, <laughs> yeah. it's really more like that than it is writing some music, which I just thought it would be more like paying a picture or something, but it's not, it's weird. Yeah. And it kind of makes me think of like kind of tangential, but like, you know, uh, the YouTuber Cody Co. Mm-hmm. he, um, you know, the, you remember the old app I'd cap that where you'd take a picture and it'd throw like a funny caption on it. That would be yeah. like, yeah, yeah. He made that. Like he created that and the app no longer existed. No exists. way. Yeah. Because he, uh, you know, I think he sold it off and the company he sold it to didn't upkeep it. And eventually like it just wasn't. Was he a developer or he just. Yeah. He was, he's a full stack engineer. Um, Cody Co. Yeah. Whoa. <laughs> like he has his master's in computer science and all that stuff. Whoa. Yeah. Wow, I got mad respect for him now, dude. I thought I, I saw something that said he was on the dive team in college too. Yeah. And maybe that's just like the, he's both of those things. But I was like, I obviously don't know a lot about this guy. And then it turns out he's a developer. I'm like, this guy is different, dude. <laughs> yeah. But it's, it's funny that you say that because everyone knows him for his like audio content like his yeah. videos and his podcasts and stuff and his music it, even exactly no one remembers him for being a developer because the thing is once you stop keeping up whatever your product is on that it's gone yeah like while his podcasts are always going to be available mm-hmm. his you know music's always going to be available and, and stuff like that so i just think that's like a really solid example where someone literally went from building apps and yeah. launching them as products to now doing you know media yeah, that's why I'm trying to like intertwine the podcast and the, the app in a way that they grow together, you know, and so that I don't have to worry too much about w- one of the two getting lost because like at least like say I the app goes under, you know what I'm saying? I still have talked about it for a couple of years on the podcast and like like documented that journey and now I can move on to do something else, but it's not like lost in the wind like that, you know? You know, and um yeah, it's funny I actually like I started like making rap music for a moment, like, and it didn't work. Like, cause like, I just needed, 
like the, the, the app got too much of like a business focus and it used, to, when I was just coding by myself, it was like an artistic expression to me, you know, and I needed another like artistic outlet. And so I was like, maybe I'll make music. And I was like trying to rap about like drive fitness. Like, like I was like, this is not like, <laughs> do we have one of those songs? <laughs> no, no, no. I don't think they ever made it out of the draft stage. It was like, okay, this is not for me. You know what I'm saying? But I was like experimenting with ways. Cause I knew I couldn't just make like a rap album about like, like getting drunk or something like and try to run this fitness app like i knew like everything had to align a little bit yeah. or else it was just like random you know and so then the podcast was able like a way for me to talk about startups and technology and shit and like align it in, in, in a different way and it for some reason like you wouldn't think of this as an art form but to me this is i think of this as like an art form it's like weird you know it's like um it's almost like dancing you know what i'm saying with like a partner not to be weird, but like you gotta like you gotta like go back and forth, you know, like yeah. and like make it work. It's 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 very like impromptu, like little little, little create creativity session. I don't know, but it's dope. Yeah, I definitely agree with you on that, and that makes me think of like um, Tyda Dan. Like he made he tried to do like his rap thing, and I think he still does it here and there. But, but he, like since he has a clothing line, that all kind of aligns with him better. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Exactly. Like, rappers love to have clothes, you know, clo clothes and shit. But I love what he's doing with his shirts and his raps and all. Just yeah. his it's whole. Tight his, is a is an experience. He's not yeah. a person. He's an experience. Well, he's, <laughs> he's building a brand, right? You know yeah. what I'm saying? And like that's what I'm trying to do. It's 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 a little smoother for Dan, I think, with his shirts and his music and shit. But I mean. If you build up a brand, dude, you can make any product that spawns out of that brand or, you know what I'm saying? Like you, you, you can do a lot with it, you know, which is what I hope to do, but it's not easy. It's not easy because people got to love your brand. They got to like, they, yeah, it's, it's got to be so good. They love whatever you do. I could drop some shoes next week and people would buy it, you know, like yeah, they, exactly. they wouldn't, but I'm saying like, if you had a good <laughs> brand, you know, that's kind of like try fitness sneaks coming to you soon. That's what that was. We have merch, dude. We have merch. <laughs> it's not quite um, die happy yeah. uh, quality, but you know, it's getting it's there. I do like that you kept the dumbbell. You know, stayed true to the like original. You know, it's more developed now. The logo, yeah, yeah, yeah. I developed I that myself, and then Quava, she kind of like put the like a barbell through it. Mine was just the D, you know. Yeah, but yeah, I didn't want to do like something completely new. Someone designed me once like a really detailed dumbbell, like. And I was like, nah, nah. I like like the more symbolic looking. Logos. Yeah, because it's thinking about when you think about famous logos, like the Nike swoosh. Is that something insane? So I, I think it's cool when people make complex logos, but people aren't going to remember that. Mm. So I really like it. It's like um, it's a cool, very simple way to to relate it to your brand in like all directions. Because it's it kind of looks like a D, but also mm. yeah, you know, fitness and exercise as well. Thanks, man. I like it too. I hope. <laughs> yeah, I, hope I no, hope so. <laughs> I hope no big wig investor comes along and changes it someday. Like you know, what we need unless they pay you a grand sum of money, because then at least you know. Yeah. Ease the pain a little. Yeah. If I ever to, change to you personally, not as investor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If I ever change my logo, you know, I'm I'm doing good in life because that means I settle for something. Yeah. Um, that's funny. Um, so let's see. One more thing I wanted to talk about, especially while we're on the topic of podcasting, is. You had some sort of little show, right, where you were interviewing different entrepreneurs. Um, you said you were just doing it on your phone. It was like five to, to like 30 minutes, you know. Um, what made you start that show and like how was that whole experience for you? What did you learn from interviewing entrepreneurs? Yeah, I just thought it and I think your you know, show relates really well to this too. Um, but like whenever we went through the accelerator program when we got to meet all the people... And they would have these really like cool inspirational stories, something like you wouldn't know just by seeing that person on the street walking by or like, you know, people in today's age were a little bit more technical where you wouldn't sit there and be like, hey, what do you do for a living? Or like, hey, tell me something about yourself. So I thought it was a cool way to kind of bring those stories forward. Like you hear about all the success going on in Silicon Valley or like different companies. But does anyone know the story leading up to like Airbnb? Mm -hmm. Some people do for Uber because that's a pretty popular one. But like a lot of those stories go untold. So I thought it would be really cool to just focus on um, different levels of entrepreneurs as well. So it'd be able to relate to everyone um, and just kind of share their stories, whatever it may be. How did you know they get to that point, but mainly focus on like their failures? Because like I think as a society, we hear failure and we're like, oh, no, that's bad. 
But um, a lot of the time, that's what gets a company to uh, get to that product that really makes them shoot off or, you know, helps an entrepreneur find their happiness after, you know, they've done a bunch of things and didn't work out. So I think we just kind of undervalue failure. And that was the whole reasoning behind starting it, which I, you know, I enjoyed that a lot. It was a really cool experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man, that's pretty powerful. I'm like I said, I had a low point once. Right. And and after our um, accelerator program, it was basically a failure for me. You know, I didn't I didn't really have my a, a way to make money. I didn't have a good business plan and um, I was left empty handed. Right. And I thought the accelerator program was going to like save my company or, you know, I thought it was going to be our lifeline, you know, and it was a good program. Like I'm not like trying to get down on the program, but like I wasn't ready at that time to make money. And I felt like that was the end of the road, you know, and that was a, I've had maybe one or two failures before that, but that was the first big failure where it was like, shit, like, I don't know if I'm going to keep going. And I did keep going. And it's like, now I could fail again and again and again. I failed more since then, but like getting over that first big failure is such a big moment to be like, okay, like, first of all, life goes on. You know what I'm saying? As yeah. a human, I, like, I probably learned that lesson beforehand, but as a human, you need to know that like life goes on after that and things will get better or, I mean, you'll have your ups and downs, but then as a company too, it's like, if, if you can hit rock bottom and then pick yourself back up together again, it's like, you guys can withstand a lot. You know what I'm saying? And you guys can keep pushing and finding the right moment because i mean there's you can give up you know but you could always radically pivot too you know what i'm saying and there's always like a moment to pivot like there's always the option to completely pivot and do something different and be f adaptive and on your toes and not ever like just ex accept failure you don't have to accept failure necessarily you know what i'm saying yeah and i think that's just like in all portions of life like you think about way back when and i'm not gonna be like back in my day you know where people are like oh the old world is better or anything like that but i think we've just become like a lot more impatient as people because you used to have to wait like a few days for a letter if you wanted to hear from someone that wasn't in front of you mm -hmm. but now it's like i can text someone and then respond within two seconds and get a response within another two seconds mm -hmm. really quickly so i feel like that has kind of contributed to that if like like you were saying you wanted to make to get to the point of making money in your company at that point and you weren't getting that instant feedback um there was like a moment lapse where you're like maybe you know this is the end of the road but um rather you know you took the high road and we're like let's take this long term and that's really been an experience of growth for you so i think that's awesome yeah and i think it really shows a good story too it's weird like on a personal level like if you accept failure then you start to accept failure you see it more often like if as a person i was like this company failed i'm a failure and like then like you'll start to see more patterns of failure and it'll become more of a habit you know whereas like if you don't accept failure and you continue to persevere then you build that habit of persevering and you build you know it's like and, and this is a like grand scale but it's like small things like waking up in the morning like you know, if you sleep through your alarm, you're a failure. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> Hitting me in the soft spot, Tom. But you know what I'm saying? Like, if you yeah. say you're going to turn in your assignment and you don't, failure. And then you start to accept more and more patterns of that. And it's like, it's like, you got to, it's very important then to set realistic goals and shit too, you know, of like, okay, I'm going to wake up at 10 instead of nine because you'll actually wake up and then you succeeded. The little small things like have a big psychological effect on you. And like, you know, it was probably like a bunch of other, even smaller persevering moments in my life that build up to the point where I was able to persevere past that company failure. You know what I'm saying? And I feel like it's important to build up those habits and the mindset before you even get behind the wheel of, of a startup to like have the mindset of like, there is no such thing as failure or well I, failure but like like we're like How we're the we type of company it. i'm the type of person that overcomes it like i always hit my marks like you know i set realistic you know milestones and um yeah like right now i'm like you know we need to um add this new small feature in and then we hit that milestone success we're succeeding you know like hit like i don't know i don't know what i'm saying but you know yeah it's interesting it's, interesting. it's like a mix of a creating those like you were saying realistic goals but also the moments when you do hit failure like don't take it as the end all be all like yeah. oh my life's over or like oh this is awful um take it as like a learning experience it's growth mm. um and i think that you know a lot of the time today you hear about 
some of the people that you strive best in this world are people that maybe failed out of college the first time. I remember it's actually from this tattoo right here. Um, that's why I got it. Was uh, one of my professors. Uh, it's the fundamental theorem of calculus. Um, that's so nerdy, dude. Yeah. <laughs> it's now on my body forever. Um, Whatever. This is a nerdy podcast. Dude. I'm about it. <laughs> I mean, both software engineers. So there's not yeah. much. <laughs> Doesn't get more nerdy than this, dude. Um, but he he uh, failed out of college. His first semester, he got a zero point zero GPA. Oof. Yeah, but now he's a professor of mathematics at JMU. He has his PhD in math uh, from UVA. Wow. So it's just like he didn't take that as that experience as like, okay, you know, my life's over. Um, this is it. And, you know, he he did have to overcome some things. And, of, of course, there's some, you know, mental health uh, things around that that might um, affect you even further within those experiences. But it's really cool that the people that hit those big failures early on are usually the ones that find their path and you know strive mm-hmm. the best in life um yeah that was one of the biggest actually pieces of advice from our program was fail fast right if you're gonna yeah. fail fail fast yeah it's interesting man i've it's hard for me not to talk about clubhouse because i've been on there a lot lately but <laughs> clubhouse has actually really allowed me to pitch my idea to a bunch of investors really fast and fail like i've had a bunch of ideas that have gotten shot down in the past month and like it would have taken me forever to find a good investor or maybe a good fitness expert to go run into in the real world. And like on clubhouse, I've just been like going crazy, like, like, like throwing ideas out there, getting fail, failure, failure. You know what I'm saying? This person's like, it's bad. It's good. It's bad. Whatever. Like I actually haven't, I probably pitched like 10 investors and like, no, like no one is like giving me any money. So I've like failed 10 times. You know what I'm saying? But I've only got, I've been on the app for like a month, you know? Like imagine if I was trying to meet all those ten investors in person, like in real life. Like that would have taken me like eight years to like yeah. to like to like <laughs> yeah. set up the meeting and get and you know, get in front of them and then pitch my gym idea and then they're like no and I'm like, Okay, you know? And so I'm starting to like adjust myself with new plans and stuff, but it's like I'm just kinda of blown away that during quarantine I've been able to do that and like like hit hit those walls. Like it's like I'm looking for them now. You know, you gotta be looking for them almost, you know, if you want to do them. If you want to, yeah, you can't just like play it safe, you know? Yeah. yeah, which that's like, I didn't know that you could meet investors on Clubhouse. That's really cool. Um, Cause like I remember, for example, like either the program we went through, we didn't reach the investor portion, which the only reason we got to meet them was because we had been accepted into this program. Yeah. So it's already exclusive as it is. Yeah. And then you get one day out of the like three month program to meet them. Or like when in Vine Tech we were looking for like angel investors at one point and we didn't end up finding any. We had called like all the firms in the area and none of them would have a sit down with us. So that's like really cool that there's now something out there to where you can you can do that really quick. It's and like it's Shark. Kind of it's like note, Shark Tank on there. Yeah, that's yeah. that's really cool. I like, never checked out the app. The only time I was on there was to hear uh, Elon roast the Robin Hood mm-hmm. CEO. Yeah, <laughs> I missed that, but apparently that was hilarious, dude. It was really funny. People are like, damn, Elon's one of the best journalists around, dude. <laughs> Doge to the moon. But yeah, so they have these like, room. well, you know what Clubhouse is, right? You know, yeah. people, there's like a little stage and there's an audience. People can get up there and talk. It's like an interactive podcast. And so they'll get these rooms of like 10 investors together and they'll just like let people start cycling through and do like a three minute pitch. And I've seen people get like invested and like I've seen money get pushed around or like we'll talk offline, you know, kind of deals go down. And the the thing is, though, they they I heard them talking once about like, should we have a process where you have to apply? And they were like, no, nah, like it's kind of fun to let anyone up here because it's also like a form of entertainment. It is like a podcast. It is not it. They're there to actually make do business, but they're also there to grow their following on Clubhouse because these investors are, they have thousands of thousands of followers and followers are currency these days. So they're also there to be like entertaining. And so for me to go up there and they shit all over my gym idea, which (laughs) (laughs) they didn't shit on it, but like, um, they were constructive, you know, but, but to, to, to destroy somebody, you know, is like kind of entertaining and funny, you know, like, so it's, it is like this like shark tank kind of environment in a lot of these rooms on there. And you can get in front of some really rich people and pitch your idea. And I mean, this is helpful. It's just helpful to like, it's basically what we did at the end of the accelerator program, but in a virtual room with honestly, probably more people. There's probably like 800 people in my, in one of like the biggest room that I pitched my idea in. That's pretty cool. And what, there was probably like 400 in our room. Yeah. 
I mean, they're all online, but like, shoot, that's as real as Plus, real that's life. like just the nerves. Like, you'll be able to pitch better in that scenario. Cause I just remember mm-hmm. I, um, I've gotten better at presenting, but in that moment, I was not the most confident presenter at all. And I like blacked. I don't remember the presentation. <laughs> but like, that's in hilarious. That, it's a lot more comforting to like build up before you get to those points. You know, of course, we're in COVID. That's uh-huh. going to be a while. But like once we can go in person again, like that's sick that you get to practice way like a lot more times within a short period of time. So yeah. When you really do get like your real shot or like a big you know opportunity, you're prepared for it. I like yeah. that a lot. Or it's like just shooting your shot. It's like Russian roulette or something. Yeah. Not Russian roulette, but <laughs> that's the wrong word. <laughs> it's like uh, maybe normal roulette or whatever, but it's basically... Um, <laughs> Rolling the dice, it's like maybe you got one in a million or something. But the point is, is like uh, I can go up there and and pitch twice a week, you know. Yeah. Um, and maybe someone will like. Maybe that is my. Maybe it actually is my big shot. You know what I'm saying? Or maybe I'm just practicing. I yeah. don't know. But like maybe there is someone who's like, oh, I, I know what you're saying. Like, yeah, that hasn't like happened a to me plus yet. Plus plus though. Yeah, that yeah. happened. That hasn't happened to me yet. There's been other people who like wanted me to do something else with the app that I wasn't doing, and I was like, I don't know, but. Whenever I pitch the gym idea, no one's like about it, but maybe someday someone will be, you know, and someone will just, I I didn't need to actually go through those, um, like official gatekeeper type of, um, moments that you used to have to go through, you know, I don't know. It's like, we saw this with like artists and like a bunch of other things online, right? You know, content creators, like you can get famous, you know making music in your basement now you can get famous yeah. making youtube videos in your basement now well may, you can get investments may, you know without like going through the the usual channels as an entrepreneur now too it's it's weird yeah which i i really like that because like um and something like of course to mention just like a little piece of knowledge i got from the when i was talking about the uh um venture capital investor who had started like foundation capital out in silicon valley um he was telling me like standard investors usually it's either a billion dollar idea or they don't care about it Mm. like if your idea is anywhere like within the millions range they don't want to invest in it because it's not seen as like one of their do or die situations a lot of the time so like i wouldn't take the you know them you know of course take the critiques as like constructive but um where do you see except for like there's not a whole lot of gyms that are giant you know multi-billion dollar companies which is probably what they're seeing yeah so like i really like the uh, smart gym idea i'm being a little biased but i think it's cool <laughs> i like it a lot yeah because i'm a you know big data guy i think um you know looking at data and seeing you know the change over time is really interesting yeah i i think that they just get frustrated because i have the app so they just see that as super scalable so they're like why would you go open up a gym you know like put it in other like put it in other gyms or do something different with it which i get that but um you're right right they want to see me become they want a really small chance i'll become a billionaire instead of like maybe a pretty good chance that i'll just be a millionaire you know because the way i see it as far as like risk myself like if i just try to have like a fitness app only you know and I'm competing with all the other fitness apps. You know how many fitness apps there are? Like 130. <laughs> yeah. Like there's a lot of fitness apps. There's so many, you know. And you know, all if I get if I do well, I'm just gonna get attacked by other fitness apps. You know what I'm saying? They'll yeah. they'll pay for ads right over like my search algorithm, and and they'll you know what I'm saying they'll play dirty. Like, and if I have a cool idea, they'll adopt that feature and stuff. You know, like it's it is. Uh, I there's a bigger payout maybe just to be the software company, but I mean it's it's like and like we were saying about how no one could use your app anymore. You know what I'm saying? Like I could build up a huge user base and then they all leave. You know what I'm saying? No one's loyal to a certain app these days, you know, like you could all, like all your users could leave tomorrow. All your investors could change their mind. All your competitors can adopt your ideas and stuff. And it's just, it's a, it's a scary thing to do, but it's like, if, if I were to just go after a gym, you know what I'm saying? Look, doing really, really, really well would be like, I have a chain of gyms, 150 gyms in the country, like all over the place. But like doing pretty well means I might just have one location and it's just making me money and I'm happy and like cool. And like, yeah. like to me, I'm like, that seems like a, a, a realistic amount of risk I would like to take, you know, because it's like if I don't do if I do pretty well with a software app, it's never going to convert over to me like running this full time. But if I do pretty well at like owning a gym, it's like 
I'm going to have members and they're going to pay me money and it's going to be fine. I'm just, I might not ever be able to like open up the second location, but investors don't want that. They, you know, like you were saying, they like want the- that doesn't make any investor happy just to be like, yeah, I like I invested in this one gym, like, you know, but for me, like if I ever just own one gym, like that would be the, like the world that would be like, oh, that's all I've ever, it's all I've ever really, like really wanted. Obviously I hope it does better than that, but it's like, I don't know. Yeah, and I think like um, that's fine. One thing a lot of entrepreneurs don't talk about is like uh, the amount of luck that like the big people have that we see, like uh, Zuckerberg, Bezos. Like that was like, yeah, they worked hard and all that stuff. But mm. there's hundreds of other people that also worked hard trying to become a billionaire yeah. that failed and didn't end up in the history books. They mm-hmm. didn't end up on the big news channels, and you never heard about them. Um, so I think like uh, it's really cool that you have. That outlook of like, cool, if I became a billionaire, awesome. But like, you know, if I owned one gym, I would be more than happy. Like, and I think that outlook is something a lot of people are missing now because you see the lights and like that comparative thinking between your peers, especially as an entrepreneur, when everyone's constantly posting what they're doing or like publishing their accolades. Mm -hmm. Um, You always want to compare yourself to them, but rather like you have that contentment with and I am passionate about this idea and I like it. And as long as I build a sustainable life where I can support myself and my family, that's good. And I I really like that outlook that you have. And I think that's like missing a lot. Yeah. I like how you brought up Zuckerberg too, because I didn't even think about it. Like if you're in like, say the social media space, you have to worry about big companies attacking you, stealing your ideas, stealing your users and all that stuff. But Even if you make it and you're number one and you're Zuckerberg and you're the biggest player in the social media landscape, to stay number one, you have to attack people and exploit people's data and make money around every cost. It's like being number one isn't even great either. Like I don't know him personally, but he might not actually want to make all of the business decisions he's making, but he has all those um, people that invested in his shareholders that are investing in his company that he's got to grow every year. You know, like I feel like you get put... And if you were to succeed and be a giant tech company, even if you did make it to number one, you're getting put in a position that you don't always want to be in sometimes, you know? Yeah. I don't know. Doesn't and I mean, seem... you think about like, um, I know this one comes up a lot because like Snapchat, like Facebook and Instagram both added the stories yeah. thing. And um, I don't think a lot of people know that like Facebook tried to buy Snapchat and Snapchat said no. Mm-hmm. So ever since every time Snapchat comes out with a new feature... Instagram and Facebook released the same feature like a couple weeks later. So like Snapchat started their Reels thing actually before um, Instagram started theirs. And then Facebook followed. Yeah. So it's like, it's just a constant. Now Snapchat's living that life where they're never going to reach number one. Yeah. Um, You know, of course they are still an enormous company, but most of their resources aren't going to making something cool that the founders and the people that work there are passionate about. Mm -hmm. It's about like, Oh shit! You know, yeah. Facebook just copied us again. What do we do now? Yeah, um, being Snapchat would be exhausting, dude. Yeah, that would be so exhausting. <laughs> yeah. I do feel bad for those guys. Yeah. That's actually probably one of the social medias I fell off with, kind of, just because. Yeah, I mean, other people implemented their ideas just as well as they did. Yeah, I mean, they invented stories, you know. But I mean, yeah, uh, it doesn't matter. Yeah, it's weird. You, it's you can't really uh, patent a software system either, or like. If you want to, it takes like three years to patent or like something. It takes, you know, months to years to patent something within like you have it done and sitting there by the time you're ready to patent it. So you either can release it and make money off of it or you can wait three years to release it and patent it. So it's just like, especially in the software space, it's an awful trade off there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's scary. So I feel like we glazed over this for a second about the little show that you did where you interviewed entrepreneurs. So I really like that because um, from what I can tell, right, you are an aspiring entrepreneur. You've worked with several different startups, you know, one of your own and, and a couple of other people's, right? And it feels like you're trying to get your footing and I feel like you're getting good experience, right? Building up to like whenever maybe you do launch your big company someday, right? And I feel like the the little interview show you were doing was like a great way for you to like start putting it out there to the world. Like, Hey, I'm an entrepreneur. I want to do startup type stuff in my life, but I haven't picked my idea yet. I haven't like narrowed my focus yet, but like you're learning from other people's mistakes from what they do. Right. 
So, and you know, that's uh, kind of what I'm trying to do with the show too, is like, this is like all the prequel, you know, it's like, yeah. I haven't launched whatever big thing I'm going to do someday yet. And a lot of people like wait until they do something big in life and then they start some sort of show like to like reflect on it. But yeah. like, I think you mentioned this at one point, like, let's see the journey up to that point. You know what I'm saying? That's cool. You know? And so what did you learn from other entrepreneurs? Like what was the most, um, like, yeah, what'd you learn the most during that time period and how did that help you, you know, with like the way you approach maybe like picking an idea someday or like, yeah. Yeah. So, um, I think one of my favorite stories on that, uh, like channel ever was, uh, actually Ben's who I started buying tech with and his was, he had, um, gone to IUP, which is in, um, in Indiana university of Pennsylvania, something like that. It's a school in Pennsylvania, you know, it wasn't for him. He left. Um, then he went to community college in Nova and then once he finished up there, he came to JMU and then kind of was just like, I don't really think school's for me, you know, which is fine. And he ended up, you know, uh, leaving school and going on to work on startups and stuff like that because he was interested. And I thought that experience was uh, like that story was just so powerful because, you know, like it's the same thing I mentioned. He went to one school and had a failure where, it, you know, didn't work out. He had to leave which people would see as a failure and he had to move back home, which a lot of people see as a very, you know, negative thing. And then he kept moving, got his, you know, associates. Once he was done there, he came to JMU, you know, and then figured out this wasn't for him, you know, failed again. And, it, you know, and then he went through the experience with, um, with other startups that didn't make it either. So I just really think his way of viewing things is cool. Just because he takes those fail those failures very much on the ball, and he reflects on them and sees what it's taught him, but he doesn't let it destroy him, and it's very prevalent within his story. Um, and I think overall, the other thing um, that that also really taught me was um, both that and my experience with Vine Tech was kind of uh, taking a step back from entrepreneurship for the time being to kind of build up my own capital because mm -hmm. I'd been seeing these people, you know, live off either living off nothing or living on um, an investor's agenda and things like that. Um, so I kind of just want to be able to build up some of my own money like, you know, you're kind of doing right now and give myself a leeway or a time period where I can say like, OK, I don't have to work for this year or whatever. Mm -hmm. Now I can work on things I'm passionate about and, you know, put money towards that instead of either living the hard rough and tumble eating just rice and beans to survive type deal or going to the you know other side of things where you're living more comfortably but it's not on your own terms mm -hmm. um i think those are two of the really strong things that it that it was able to teach me um and you know it's just really cool especially when you're you're talking to somebody about their experience you can look in their eyes and like see the emotion behind it and see like the experience they had it's not just like words coming out of their mouth like you know their eyes will water up a little bit or you'll hear them say a portion of the story and their you know um their dimples start to show even if they don't have a full smile and mm -hmm. you can really see the emotion there so i thought just that overall was really neat um because you would see them hit points where it was like damn that was hard but i got through it um and it was also cool just to see the differentiation between each of them because some of them would have failures like i said ben would take it you know he took it extremely well but then there would be others that would hit it and just be like, damn, that sucked. So just to kind of see how independent and autonomous each individual is and how they process things was a really cool experience, uh, especially within, uh, you know, entrepreneurship being such a niche thing. Everyone kind of thinks of entrepreneurs all as the same type of person, like grind 24 seven, you know, mm -hmm. nothing else matters. But there's really a whole lot of differentiation between all the individuals uh, within the, uh, you know, industry field of work whatever you want to call it yeah it's, it's so different right there's some people who are like i'm gonna do everything myself and there's some people who are like i'm basically just kind of funding this you know and it's you know you can you can find a lot of like range in between there um yeah i like what you said about telling stories because that's something i've noticed on clubhouse too is like the best of these pitches always have a very emotional story that pair with them and i haven't really f i don't really have a great story for mine you know if I do have one, it would be like my little brother kind of got addicted to video games and I want to 
make fitness addicting like that you know what i'm saying but like i don't really want to throw my little brother under the bus sorry for listening. <laughs> but like he, it also wasn't that bad you know what i'm saying like it, I, and it wasn't just him either you know like i could single him out and make it seem like worse than it was but in general i just saw a lot of people in high school get really addicted to video games and like like it was some sort of drug or something and it really kept them from like being healthy and, and being active and um, you know, it just, but like, I don't really have like this, like heart wrenching story to pair along with it. It's, it's a lot of just like, I think this is really cool. You know, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> like, I wanted to smart him cause it sounds dope as fuck, dude. Like, that's, <laughs> like, come on, it'd be sick, bro. You know, like that's really it, you know? So I'm like trying to like work on my story here and I don't know, even like my failures, they don't explain why I started the company in the first place necessarily. So that's something that I feel like is important that I'm still trying to like figure out. Do you have like your story? Is that something that you're working through? Like what is, or at least up to this point, like what is like the summary of your journey and story and why you're continuing to push, you know, into like the engineering entrepreneur space? Yeah. Um, and I, I, we kind of brushed over it slightly earlier, that idea of burnout. Mm -hmm. So like when I had started, especially when like you had first met me, I was like a uh, work 24 seven. I think I slept like three hours a night. Mm -hmm. It was extremely unhealthy, but that's just, um, especially within, like I mentioned earlier, entrepreneurs are all different, but I had this mindset of like, if I want to be an entrepreneur, this is what I have to be mm -hmm. at a work 24 seven. I, you know, no time for social, no time for, um, you know, fun or sleep or healthier things like going to the gym. Um, and I cut everything else out in my life besides work. And I was doing like, um, one semester I did, uh, 21 credits and I was on four project teams. Um, and I was working on, uh, I just started Vine Tech and I was still like closing up play well. And that was just like, I slept like two hours a night. It was insane. And I, um, really drove myself, uh, to burn out. I kind of spent this past like beginning of COVID as like a recovery time. You know, mm -hmm. since everything else slowed down, it was really beneficial for me to just take a step back and really look at life and decide what things in it um, I valued and I really cared about. Um, so I think like that portion of my story is really something I I hold strongly is um, there's this idea, at least in, in some people's perception, that to be successful, you you either have to be number one or you have to spend every single hour of every single day working on it. Like you'll hear um, the story I hear constantly about like Elon slept in um, the PayPal offices when he started it, or he mm -hmm. still sleeps in the Tesla factory sometimes. Mm -hmm. Like that's insane. If that works for him, great. Like yeah. to reach, um, you know, success, you don't have to do that. There aren't like any things that um, are like check boxes to be like, yep, this is, um, I have to do these five things and I will be successful. Um, it was kind of just a, a journey of figuring out what my own definition of success was and where I would be happy seeing myself. Um, and, you know, what are the limits of that and how far could it go? But as well as what is the lower bound of that, you know, making sure that that lower bound um, is something that's uh, both achievable and that I don't lose sight of trying to get to that, you know, small chance of a lot of riches, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, which is what I was doing for a constant constant bit and it's just really uh it's really draining on you know someone's mental health um and just how they they perceive themselves too yeah no i did the same thing where um yeah i remember you and uh matt were in that office in the ice house like 24 7 yeah but i did that for like three or four years like yeah <laughs> like i like worked very hard the year before to get into the startup program so I like w was coding like 30, 40 hours a week on top of my like last year of school, which wasn't that hard, but I was still going crazy. And then we launched, we got into the program where I worked like 80 hours a week with Jamazos because he was working. So he had to work after his job got off every day. So then in order to just like, I wasn't just going to like work 40 hours and like be like, all right, peace, you know? So like I stuck with him. We both did that. And then once I got, then we kind of had the failure moment, but once I got into my career, I was like, okay, I can't let dry fitness stop. 
I can't let this stop. And so then I would work after work for the two, like, like for two years after I graduated, you know what I'm saying? And then just recently, like, um, you know, uh, due to COVID, I was laid off and that's when I sort of like rebuilt myself with like healthier. First of all, I was just getting out of shape. So I was like, you know, everything like aligns with like my goals, but I was like, I can't be fat and run this fitness company. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like I need to, to take 300 a 300 pound fitness founder. Yeah, yeah. I at least need to take a step <laughs> back and like do that. Right. But I ended up like, and I thought I was going to get a lot of done, a lot of work done during this time period. Um, like as far as like grinding on like code or work or something, but I actually like did a lot of work on like my own mental health and my own psyche and my ideas for the company. And like, I'm doing like, um, what's it called? I think it was Da Vinci said, man does the most sometimes when he does the least, you know what I'm saying? And just like this pitching my idea on clubhouse and things like that, that don't seem like, Oh, I'm just coding every day. You know, like I'm doing, like I kind of got my head out of the clouds and I'm like, getting in a healthier lifestyle and I'm doing things health and I'm like I'm like first worried about like my own mental health, my own physical health and my own sleep and things like that and then I'm worried about the ideas and then I'm worried about the business plan and then I'm worried about the software last. You know what I'm saying? Where usually I, I flipped it around and I was like software company, put the software first, code 40 hours a week, no questions asked, you know? And the thing is it's like since I rewired myself, I'm actually doing a lot more, you know what I'm saying? Because I'm not forcing myself to do as much. And then like Matt the other day was like, bro, you're doing so much, man. Like all these like, like Instagram posts you're doing and all these like things. And I was just like, oh shoot, like I guess I am, I'm not trying to do a lot anymore. And now I am getting a lot done by not, because it's just like naturally happening, you know? Yeah. Cause I'm just almost... doing what gets me excited again and not what I like feel like I have to do, you know? Yeah, so. exactly. It's almost like um, they talk about it sometimes. If you have like a 40 hour work week, but only like 20 hours of work to do, a lot of the times employees will just sit there on social media for the other 20. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like that thought process of like you just feel like there's some moments in entrepreneurship where you just feel like you have to be spending hours and hours on like, like you said, like hard coding or something that has like a physical output with like a... Uh, you know, fast feedback to be like, oh, look at this. Like, it's real. When, you know, sometimes you just got to take that step back, like you were saying. Mm. And it, it really helps and helps you move forward as well, you know. And it, and it helps you get things done a lot more efficiently. Yeah. Yeah, I think. And I think that's why people like Elon work so much is because it doesn't feel like work to them. You yeah. know, they do work a lot. But, like, if it starts to feel like work, I, I feel like you're not doing something right. Like, something's wrong, you know. And this yeah. podcast has also helped me like kind of align myself back with like enjoying this process and like, like I don't feel like I'm working right now but like that's when like Matt was telling me he's like dude you're working so much like you're getting so much done I'm like this this pod what I'm doing in this moment like this doesn't feel like work to me that's why I'm like oh I'm doing a lot oh yeah oh yeah you know but it like doesn't feel like a lot but if you're doing if you if you align it all right then it won't feel like work and you won't burn out. And then like you were saying with some of the Vintech stuff, it felt like work. It felt like not right. And that, that will drain you so much. You know what I'm saying? And that's when you do have to like find a different path or a different venture or something, you know, cause it's just, you, you, it, it takes so much to keep these companies running that you can't, you can't keep going unless your heart's in it, you know? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's like, um, like you said, just really, uh, self-aligning. Um, and things like that and making sure you're on that page is super helpful because I think I just reached a point where I valued work over my happiness and I was just like work 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 it didn't matter if I was enjoying it it was just like oop I see a project getting done oop I you know met this goal at xyz and I just um was fueling myself off that quick positive feedback of like oh I'm getting stuff done but that doesn't last forever. Like yeah, it's not. Are, and are overall. you getting the right stuff done? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You're just working on useless uh, kind of tangential stuff sometimes. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm glad you did like push yourself super hard though early on and at different times because you do need to know like you need you do need to know to like how to put yourself in that mindset of like today's an eighty hour, like this week's an eighty hour work week. I gotta just do it, you know, and like see if this life was the right life for you. But uh, also like you know most successful entrepreneurs are like 40 years old, you know, like um, chances are neither of us are going to start a company that succeeds this decade, yeah. you know, like <laughs> probably not, you know, maybe we're learning the right skills and like then when we're 40, we'll start the right one that it would just, everything aligns and we're like, this is 
why I've been working so hard to become the person that could run this company. Maybe, I don't know. Um, or maybe my company will evolve into something profitable at that time period. But you know, uh, it, it doesn't have to happen now. You know what I'm saying? Like you were saying, like there's nothing wrong with building up your own capital, getting a job for a couple of years. And like, there's certain assets that I would feel really comfortable going after the gym after like, maybe if I bought like a house or some land or like, you know, maybe if I had X amount of money invested in the stock market or crypto or something that was kind of maybe just building on itself over here. And like, I didn't have to worry, like you were saying, I didn't have to completely scrape by or I have a backup plan or, you know, there's like, I could see myself waiting 20 years and just like buying the gym outright myself because I just saved money. And that's just what I, I didn't have to like convince anyone. It was a good idea. Like it just, you know, and same for you. Like, I think you, you got the right experience you needed in college where now maybe you can attack a better idea five, 10 years from now and really, really know that you're spending all that time on the right thing, you know? Yeah. Plus like, I guess the burnout that early too is really beneficial because I'd prefer that Cause you know, I kind of just had to take a hiatus from a lot of work for a bit just to, to hash things out. But that's a lot better than being like 40 married and having kids mm -hmm. and having to support a family and stuff like that. Like I really, uh, I was thankful for that now. Like it's, it was cool to learn the hard lessons early so I don't have to learn them later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 They say like having kids is like something that'll keep you from failing because you just fucking can't. <laughs> like, yeah. I gotta feed the kids. Like, like that's not, never something I want to test myself and like, let me start this company and have some kids just to like keep myself in check, you know? But like some, some entrepreneurs say like, that's how they did it is like, they Sabrina, like failure was not that? an option. Wait, what? Does your girlfriend hear that? No. He no. wants kids. No, I'm <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> For business purposes only. No. Yeah. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> Bro, that's how it used to be. You used to have a bunch of kids so they could like, um run the farms for you and stuff you know i guess that's true that's, that's a good point. i have some kids i'm like all right you're my accountant okay you're my social mo they could probably run my social media accounts better than me by the age of like five dude. you just start playing like um like i don't know uh you you demi videos to one of your kids when he's like two so he can start learning coding by the time he's like seven he's a fucking genius bro we should be teaching kids how to code man i'm really yeah. if i have kids i'll teach them how to code yeah it's was, so weird that we don't actually yeah, it's so not in like general, like, I feel like that's almost as important as like reading and writing now. Yeah. Because no, we're just it's... getting to a point where it's like, you want to start a business? Okay, well, you need a website. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, there's things like GoDaddy and all that stuff, but you still have to have a basic understanding of code. Or if you want to do anything custom off of GoDaddy, mm -hmm. then you need to know how to code. Or like a lot of products today include software in one way or another, just to be able to understand how the product works, you know, yeah, there has would... to be a little bit of that. I would say like 10 years old, 11 years old, it should be like, like you said, like English, you know, reading, writing, computer programming, science, and what history, right? Like yeah. it should be one of the core foundations starting in at least middle school, but maybe even like sixth grade, dude. Like, yeah, it's too, it's too important. It's too part, like our whole society runs off of code. You know what I'm saying? It, like it runs off of code more than it runs off of English these days, you know? Yeah. Like, so, yeah. <laughs> like, I don't know why you wouldn't want to teach people that. They never teach us the right things. Like, even for when we were growing up, like, they could have taught us, like, how to do our taxes and, like, how to, like, budget your money and, like, how to, like, just do normal things. Like, ta like taxes is one of them. It's just, like, why don't they just teach us this in, like, a class? Like, why don't they just have one class in high school where they teach you all those random skills that, like, you don't know at the age of, like, 20 years old that society expects you to know, you know? Yeah. One thing I will say is um, I do hear a lot of people from, like, at least my county in Virginia, Virginia requires like a personal finance and economics class. Super thankful for that. Mm. That sucked. Um, like looking at it from high school, I was like, why do I have to learn this shit? But it taught me how to do my taxes, taught me how to apply for jobs, like taught me how to budget and what percentages should go to like a car payment, a house payment, just to be able to live, you know, a comfortable, like a uh, stable life. Um, so that I was super appreciative about because um, like those things are super important. You know, so like you did get to learn all that in high school. Yeah, we even had um for, you. for the economics class. They even taught us like stock trading. They had like one oh. of the fake ones where you go in and it's like the actual stock market, but they give you like I don't know fifty thousand dollars of virtual money it doesn't exist, and you make like your fake orders to the stocks, but it actually follows the trends to see okay, like what do I learn from this experience? Like if I buy 
a lesser known penny stock could either shoot up or it's going to, you know, tank. And they taught us all about, you know, long term stock trading things. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So I really wish neat. I learned that in high school. That'd be sick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It was super beneficial because like, um, you know, I do some trading here and there just uh just to pay my rent and bills now. And that is like something I always look back to is the things I learned in that class. And I think there needs to be, you know, a pretty big focus on not only um, the importance of like well-rounding children just in uh, terms of, like in an educational standpoint, like we do with the writing and the reading and the arts and all that stuff, but also there needs to be practical knowledge, you know, installed too, especially because practical knowledge is changing from what it was mm. back when our, our education system was established. For real, man. Yeah. yeah. Practical knowledge, man. <laughs> yeah. We need more of it. Did you learn anything from just like interviewing during that um, experience, like interviewing skills, like certain like tactics or just approaches? Um, I wouldn't say it taught me too much about interviewing as like a specific skill. It taught me a lot about like self-confidence and speaking and mm -hmm. that like um, I'd be nervous. Mm -hmm. Like it, you, it gives you, you know, pretty instant feedback when you go back and you're editing it and you're watching the clips and stuff like that. Um. And, you know, I'd be nervous and I knew within certain moments of the video, like, oh, I was shaking there or I felt like my vo voice was quivering mm -hmm. or like, um, you know, I felt like I was avoiding eye contact or something like that. And it really helped me in terms of like a communications or like presenting standpoint, because um, you would see that like, oh, the audience doesn't notice that like the camera didn't really see that. Mm -hmm. Like, I know my hands are shaking under the table and I'm like sweating a little bit, but like the camera's not seeing that you can't hear my voice quiver. So I think it was really beneficial in that aspect, just as like overall personal, you know, confidence, mm -hmm. um, confidence thing, uh, especially within like the skill of just being able to talk to people and being a social person. Um, yeah, that was extremely yeah, helpful for me. Cause like I said, I like blacked out <laughs> during that pitch. <laughs> like I, I truthfully, I remember walking up there and then I remember walking off and hugging Patrick just because I was like, oh, my God, that's over. But mm -hmm. I don't remember any of the presentation. <laughs> so, like, that was a it was a big step to be able to communicate because I wasn't, you know, very confident. I was pretty shy. Um, yeah. I mean, you then. were a freshman, bro. Like, yeah, that, that too. I You would have handled it better if you were older. But also, it's good to, like, have that early on. You know, maybe you would have blacked out as a senior. I don't know. Probably not. But, yeah. like, that set you up, you know, to get better and better. Yeah, man, I, I always thought I was good at communicating. And before I started coding, I was actually much more social. But like <laughs> I coded basically and, and just did technical shit for like three or four years straight. And then I came out of that like, oh, it's time to promote my app. And like I was not a good conversationalist. And this has really like just taught me the art of conversation. And uh, I've gotten a lot better at listening. Like I used to always come prepared with like something to say, you know. Like, I'd ask you a question and I wouldn't listen. Like, I'd just, like, be thinking about what I'm going to say next, you know? And yeah. it's super obvious if you're not listening in these podcasts, if you're just, if you're just, like, if you say something and I just, like, ask a new question without, like, acknowledging what you just said, it's, like, it doesn't make for a good conversation, you know? I'm, like, getting better at, like, drilling deeper and deeper into, like, a conversation. It's just interesting to think how bad I was at that. You know what I'm saying? Before I started practicing it, you know, you probably had some realizations too about like, Oh, I don't talk. I don't do this or that well in a conversation, you know, before you started doing your sh your little show. Yeah. I like, will say like my very first one, um, I think I had like a whole script ready, mm -hmm. like fucking 10 questions set out where it was like, I'm going to ask this one, then this one, then this one, like no, no questions about it. Yeah. Um, but, uh, then by like the third one, I was like, oh shit, that's not really how it works. Cause this is super like clunky and it's not going smoothly. And I'm not asking any feedback yeah. questions. Like you said, that come up in the moment. So like, as I went on, I think I ended up with just like three major questions with like, uh, maybe one or two that was like, if we run out of sh stuff to talk about, like just bring these up, you know? Um, yeah, but really the on the fly type of conversation, especially within like a, uh, a media setting that was helpful too, like being able to go at something a lot less prepared and still being able to make it seem a lot more natural and yeah. uh, not have that full script <laughs> ready to go with, you know, 
fucking stage directions. <laughs> yeah, I did the same. <laughs> I did the same thing for one of the early episodes, and it didn't. It turned out too scripted, and I think it turns out people would rather hear something natural than hear a better conversation that's pre-scripted. You know, for some reason, unless you're so good that you can naturally, you know, make it seem not scripted. But in general, they'd rather hear, you know, just a more natural conversation, which is what I've been really going for you know in the latest couple episodes um so i'll have like a idea and i'll tell someone like we'll talk about this topic and this topic but i won't tell anybody like questions anymore or anything and i won't even try like sometimes there's something i want to talk about and if we don't get to it it's fine it's just like i just want to have a conversation with somebody you know and yeah i don't i don't i mean the name of the podcast kind of makes it feel like it should be about fitness but i don't even want it to be about that i just i don't even want to force anybody into like a certain subject or anything, you know, I just want to flow with it. Yeah, you just kind of want to interact with other people, hear their ideas and their thoughts and share that, which I think is really cool. Because like, I, when you asked me to go on, I mentioned this earlier, but it was like, um, I was like, I don't know shit about fitness. Um, mm -hmm. I don't even work out uh, <laughs> um, uh, regularly. I try my best. <laughs> yeah, so we don't have to talk about it. Yeah, you know? like, exactly. why would I try to force you to talk like even I could be like, well, why don't you work out? You know, like I could, I can make it about fitness if I wanted to. It's like, no, like my goal now for each podcast is like, let me pump this person up and let them like really express who they are in this moment, you know, and let's, let's dance around the topics they don't know about. And let's focus on the topics that they're comfortable talking about, you know, because it's like, and sometimes I try to extract information from the audience. Sometimes I'm like, I want to know about computer science. Like, like I'm gonna ask you a bunch of questions that I want to get to my audience, you know, but it's like the best thing for everyone, you, me and the audience is, is if I get you to express who you are the best, you know what I'm saying? Because more than likely half of the audience for this podcast will be people who were friends with you who just came along to see it. You know, they want to, they don't want to see me grill you on something you're not comfortable with. Like, you know, yeah. like every like I want you to do well, you want me to have a good show. They want to have a good time experiencing it. Like yeah. it's, it's really cool when like information comes out like naturally and it's like, wow, I didn't know that, but it's like, I've stopped trying to force it. It sucks. Like it just sucks to uh, try to force someone into like, like a um, little Ted talk or something when it's like, it's not who they want to be or what they are, you know? Yeah, exactly. It just comes across like way more naturally too. And like, I'll say I've, you know, I've been through uh, some interviews here and there. I think my first podcast, especially in comparison to this one, I did do one, um, is at a company called Loki. Um, back when we had started Vine Tech and it was about that. And it just felt very scripted. Like we'd do multiple, um, nothing against that, but like we would do multiple cuts of the same, you know, response. Mm -hmm. Like they would ask us the question over and over again, take clip. When you have a clip they like best is what they included in the podcast episode. Mm -hmm. So like that just felt very unnatural, very like, okay, we're here to get whatever content they want to, you know, bring across which is okay. If that's how they run it. That's how they run it. But like, I really like this experience of just, just talking and, yeah. and kind of expressing ideas. I think it's really, uh, it's really cool. And the whole overall experience feels a lot, uh, more comforting and like, uh, natural. Yeah. Up until a couple episodes ago. And sometimes I still do this depending on what the guest <laughs> wants, but I'll try to cut out like a lot of parts of it. And I did one with Dan, um, two episodes ago, it was three hours and sometimes I'll edit when I say like, like, um, you know, and I'll, I'll like, I'll try to make myself sound better with mm -hmm. the editing. And with his, I like, didn't do that at all. I just let it run for about three hours. I cut out like 15 minutes of just like, we were talking about nothing, you know, but like for the most part, I let that one run as natural as possible. And I don't know if everyone listened to the whole three hours or if anyone did, I don't, <laughs> but I don't care. Like I like that one a lot, I, you know, yeah. and from here on out. You know, it, there's some moments maybe we'll we'll snip out, but I, as far as I can tell from this conversation, it's been pretty smooth, and I'm not gonna like over edit it, and I'm gonna like moving forward, I'm gonna try to let them get more and more natural to the point where maybe there's no editing or anything, you know. And it's, besides my uh, voice crack and me opening a, a drink, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the two little mistakes. Well, maybe now I gotta leave but the also, voice crack in, dude. This is like a, a little off topic and a very tangential. But remember back in the fucking accelerator when we used to just sit in the back room with our jewels and <laughs> it was like, I don't know why jewels were just such a huge thing at that time. And I don't know. Those were some of the moments I forget. It was like me, you, Ted, Aiden, um, and, uh, Matt. And yeah. we just sit there ripping the, ripping the vapes. <laughs> jewels were crazy. Cause you could just hit them anywhere, like in a classroom or anything. And like, no one would notice. Yeah. I've actually quit smoking. So. 
because you know stronger, I had a stronger fellow than me. Because I am. <laughs> well, know. I'm older than you too, man. That you get is like, true. You get past like 25, and you're like, all right, this is like not cool anymore. I just have like a problem, so yeah. you kind of got to put it down. Some certain things, or at least minimize them. That means I got three more years. Three more years of the uh, nicotine bu- <laughs> buzz yeah. to get me by. <laughs> Although probably jewels are pretty bad for you, but I did read yeah. something recently that vapes are not that. If you get the right vape, it's like because when I was starting to smoke, like there was no long-term studies on things. And I think yeah. long-term studies are starting to come out now and that certain vape mods are actually like not bad for you. I don't, yeah. don't quote me on that anybody, yeah. but like, I think, and I think we need more long-term studies to come out, but I think they're not going to like, they're at least much better for you than cigarettes at least. You yeah. Know? And I think the um, thing that's really interesting about vapes is like, like you said, Jules are, uh, and I like how we're going on this tangent, but, uh, <laughs> Jules are just like yeah. a little bit of fucking hard nicotine. Mm-hmm. Well, like vapes, like most, like the uh, I vape that you're more thinking of are like water based, like mm-hmm. water vapor based things. Um, so I think that's really cool. And I think it's super helpful for quitting smoking, especially because like, yeah, a lot of people in my family have, you know, used them to get off cigarettes. So that's, mm-hmm. that's a really neat aspect. Well, but. when I um, started the podcast, I was still smoking and I wouldn't talk about it at all. Like I just wouldn't because like, I think that there's like being yourself and being honest and then there's like, uh, okay, like I don't have to share this if I don't want to kind of thing, you know, where it's like, I didn't want to like promote smoking on my fitness podcast. I didn't want to put that message out there necessarily. So now that I've like quit smoking, I'm like, okay, cool. Yeah. We can talk about the fact that I used to smoke. Like I, you know, yeah, maybe I could be a voice of helping people quit in the future, but I just felt like there was no point of just like trying to like compensate like oh, it's not that bad or anything or you know just yeah it's just I mean, a little bit like i mainly brought it up for the nostalgia because those yeah. are just like some of the moments when we just went completely off business and we were just all hanging out and that's yeah. kind of what like pulled that cohort together to be you know really good friends by the end of it mm-hmm. and by the time we got to the new york trip that was a ball that was such a good time mm-hmm. um well apparently yeah. nicotine can like help you focus in on shit I, I was reading something recently too and i was like oh that's why i like nicotine so much and like yeah. i i assume a lot of like entrepreneurs smoke because it like really like i don't know it really gathers your and focuses your thoughts somehow which I'm not trying to promote it uh, once again yeah but, like it's, it, it's a it does do something that yeah. gets your you know it's stimulant it gets your mm-hmm. brain brain running yeah I, I will say especially when i coat i'll be sitting there just like yeah. ripping it the whole time that was the hardest which is awful for me that was the hardest part about quitting is coding like an all-nighter without smoking like it's yeah. really it's still hard you know sheesh yeah so like do you have any more like ideas or things that you want to pursue later on also if we have to call it quit soon we can yeah um here in a couple minutes i uh, i'll cover that really quick but um there's like, or is there anything else? Like, let's just for a second. Is there anything else you want to talk about in our last like five minutes? Not you, that I can really think of. I feel like we covered a lot of the bases and like things that I was interested when you asked me to like bring it across. Because you know, I feel like people do forget about emotions when it comes to entrepreneurship. They want to be like a machine, uh-huh. but we're not machines. So, uh, so at one I really point you said something like, "We can talk about mental health." I don't know. Oh yeah. So like, um, I didn't know you. Had, knew about that or well, yeah. everyone knows about that but right. i didn't know you had something to share or what i don't want to skip out on anything yeah so um i have like a anxiety and depression okay and that was something that i had kind of ignored while during entrepreneurship i was like you know i'm just gonna or when i was like really in the height of those things i was like i'm just gonna push through this like bootstrap it just like you know um i was financially and i was like and i'll be fine at the end of the day but there was like one moment that really hit me. Um, my grandfather, someone that's really close to me, um, <clears throat> he uh, passed away during my sophomore year. And during my junior year, a whole year later, that was in one of my like peak times. I think I was on like five different projects. I was working on Vine Tech, and that was in the height when we were really, you know, going after it. And um, I had two jobs, and I was seeing like 19 credits. So I had no time for anything. Yeah, it was nuts. It's a lot. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, one of my professors, I was talking to him because I had to be like in a business meeting and in a project meeting and in a class all at the same time. And I was like, what do I do? I've over overset myself. Like, how do I reorganize this? I wasn't like wanting to drop anything. I was like, how do I reorganize this? And he had known about my grandpa passing. And we sat down for a minute. And we were talking and he brought it up like we, we weren't you know sitting down and talking about that we were talking about like my work style and how like hard I was just going at everything and he had brought up the fact that my grandpa had passed away 
and I just started bawling. I was, I was crying. And, um, that was kind of the moment I'd realized like, holy shit, I had been working so much. I hadn't given myself time to like cope me mm -hmm. losing that, that important person in my life. And, um, I, you know, I kind of just think that's like a powerful story to share, to share. Cause a lot of people put their mental health or like the things going on in their life in the back burner mm -hmm. so they can pursue their dreams. But in reality, you can't really do that. Mm -hmm. You got to make time for both and, and find that balance that works for you. Um, but really take the time to do those checkups and be like, Hey, you know, have I really processed everything that's gone on within my experience right now? Or have I like, um, have I been pushing any uh, realizations off or, you know, problems that I've been having? So I just think that that aspect's important. Yeah. No, I interviewed my friend who's studying to be a therapist and he said, if you try to like suppress emotions that they'll eventually come out in like a bigger way, you know? And that sounds like what happened to you. You were trying to fill that void with, you know, working or something else. It's like, you can't just ignore an emotion. It'll just fester and get worse over time. And that's something that I'm with the, with the break that I took, I've been trying to work on that. And like some days, like, I'll just be like, things aren't working with drive. And I'll be like, I'm frustrated. I'm like, I'm so frustrated, you know, but like I used to gloss over that frustration and be like, I'm fine. And like, that's, eventually you're just all going to explode and you're going to have a day where you're too frustrated. You can't even handle it. And you don't even know that you're frustrated because you're not paying attention to emotions like that, you know? Yeah, exactly. And I think like, I think it almost makes you a better, you know, entrepreneur to be able to like point out like, okay, I'm at a moment where like, I just need a couple days to take a break. Mm. Cause the thing is, if like you do push through, then the work you're doing while you're in that like phase of like you were saying, like maybe frustration the work you're bringing across isn't done as well. You're not getting as much done. Like you're not um, spending your time as effectively um, because yeah. you're split between this emotion and trying to push it back while you're also trying to work on your dreams and things like that. Especially when you work with other people, they can yeah. all sense your frustration and you can't or your depression or whatever it is you're hiding. You think people don't know, but a lot of times they, they can tell, you know, and it yeah. doesn't, it's not a good work environment. You know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It it definitely like complicates things a lot. But just being able to recognize your emotions and being in tune with them really just helps all around. Especially, mm -hmm. I would say, in an entrepreneur entrepreneurial setting, because there's you know so much at stake. It's mm -hmm. not only your dreams, but like a lot of people put their livelihoods on the line. They have all their money invested in it. Where there's a lot of time, like you said, you've been working on uh, drive for years now. <clears throat> so you don't want to put that at risk just to be like, no, I'm stronger than that. I can, you know, push through or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You don't want to put the person behind it at risk too, you know? Yeah. That, that is true too. Yeah. Um, well, it seems like you've learned a lot of great lessons. Um, I really appreciate you sitting down and talk with me, man. You, you're just, you're doing things so young and you're just like, right. Like things haven't like clicked and worked out for you yet. Right. But like, they haven't worked out for me either, right? And you're four years younger than me. And like, bro, you're just, um, I'm impressed with all of like the different like engineering pursuits that you're doing. And um, I think you're really going to do something cool someday. And I'm glad that you are like sharing that knowledge with the world along the way, you know, and kind of like capturing that journey and, you know, reflecting on it instead of, you know, just trying to skip over right some emotions and steps you know it seems like you're really um you're you're really facing the hard facts you know early on that i think a lot of people are going to face a couple years down the road you know your age and they're not really dealing with those things yet you know yeah so i'm impressed man thank you for like what you just said there that means a lot especially like i remember looking back and even now seeing everything you're doing on uh, social media and through your app and everything like that, you and Matt specifically were like people I really looked up to, um, being those people that were, you know, really working hardcore in code, um, especially knew you not coming from a computer science degree and, and still being able to pursue that track without, you know, as strong of a formal education as, you know, some may have. So I just really look up to you as like a, a person as well. Um, so that means a lot coming from you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, man. Let's call it. <laughs> All right. Thank you guys so much for listening to today's episode. I hope you really enjoyed it. And thank you, Josh. Uh, I had a great time interviewing you. Can you guys please do me a favor and send an episode out to some of your friends? As I mentioned at the beginning of the episode, 
we are getting really close to our first thousand downloads, and I'm gonna push to try to get um, a thousand downloads within our first year. So by the end of March, uh, we're currently at 900, and yeah, I'd really appreciate if you guys just shared an episode or two with a friend or two that you might think would actually enjoy it. All right, thank you guys so much. Have a wonderful day. Peace.